Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Beach Buster Show. Coming to you from the studios in Lake Norman, North Carolina. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Binge Buster Show. And my guest this week is a regular on the independent North Carolina circuit. It's none other than a member of the Storm Legacy, Joe Storm. Joe, how you doing tonight? Terrific, Tommy. How are you, my brother? I am doing good, my friend. Long time no speak to. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. Man, I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, so tell me, uh, the, when 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 was it you started wrestling? Um, I started uh, training in uh, early nineteen ninety six. Ninety six, okay. And, yeah, uh, and where where and, where'd, uh, where'd you start at? I, I started with um, Ken Spence. Um, uh, a little bit of backstory: I, like most people involved in pro wrestling, I, I grew up. Uh, as a tremendous wrestling fan, um, came up, uh, or grew up during the, uh, Jim Crockett promotions era. Um, some of my youngest memories from the time I was five and older, uh, was, uh, most of those have to do with, uh, wrestling, watching wrestling, uh, East coast championship wrestling, mid Atlantic championship wrestling and things of that nature. And, um, uh, I started uh, going to uh, independent shows when um, I was still in high school. And at that time, um, ACW, uh, uh, Robbie Allman and uh, Jerry McNeil's promotion uh, would run the Burlington Armory. And I grew up down in Burlington. Okay. And um, after I got out of high school, I was uh, working with uh, the rescue squad in Alamance County and um started going to the shows and we did a couple of standbys there at the armory and uh uh once they were coming on a monthly basis uh and i started to know some of the guys i pestered the ever living crap out of tim blades uh constantly hey how can i get into wrestling and and all those things and during that time it was still a closed business and um you know, you, you had to know somebody in order to get a foot anywhere. And I guess he finally got uh, tired of me asking and pestering him. And um, he said uh, at one of the shows, he was like, well, there there's going to be a trainer and he'll be here later tonight. His name's uh, Ken Spence, and I'll introduce you to him. And they went about doing their thing. And Probably midway through the show, King came in. He was sitting in a chair against the back wall. And um, uh, after the show, Tim took me over there and introduced me to him. And um, Kim, Kim was like, well, I've got a, a school up in uh, Clemensville. Uh, I'm sorry, Clemens. Uh, Clemens, they yeah. were training up in Clemens there. And um, and he was like, uh, we do um, open workouts on Sunday, so stop by. On Sunday, we'll, um, I'll talk to you about some things and, and uh, so forth. And uh, during that time period, uh, even though I was working with Alamance County Rescue, I was also uh, uh, EMT Intermediate with, uh, at that time, High Point Rescue and Ambulance, which is now PTOL. Okay. And um, I had a, a buddy that I worked with named Roy Hayes, and he was big into wrestling and, and all of these things. So, uh, I, you know, I, I go in, I hide, and I tell him I've met this trainer, and, hey, let's get into the wrestling business. Crazy. And uh, so we, we go up on uh, that Sunday and uh, watch the guys very little. Uh, right after we got there, he made everybody get out of the ring, and um, he got us in. I can't remember who gave us the, uh, the bumps, but... Um, we took three bumps apiece, um, a body slam, a side slam, and a snap suplex. And then they got us out of the ring, and he was like, okay, you're uh, going to be sore for the next couple of days. Give me a call in about a week, and um, if this is something you want to do, then I'll bring you back in. We'll, we'll talk about the cost of training and things like that. And um, called him back two days later, and I'm like, yep. 
I want to do this. And um, uh, he quoted uh, the training price. And uh, we set up payment arrangements. And I trained for six months, um, two to three days a week before we ever did anything in front of a crowd. Now, uh, when whenever you were training there with Ken, was uh, that back when he had his ring in that barn? It it, it wasn't. Um, a, well, I wasn't uh, there when it was a barn. There was the the ring was in a in a cinder block building. Okay, out behind the house, and they had uh, essentially gutted the inside of the house. They cut the rafters, the top of the rafters out. And the ring height versus the ceiling height was so close where if you wanted to do anything off the top rope, you you were literally kind of leaning over with your back up against the peak of the roof. Okay. But no no drywall, no bathrooms, uh, definitely no air conditioning. Uh, They had a little propane jet heater thing that we used in the winter and... uh, uh, by the time we the the school migrated to the uh, VFW on Glen Avenue, that was like a mansion compared to the house. Okay, yeah. When when I trained with Ken, uh, his ring was was in a barn. Um, I think it was in Walkertown or Winston Salem. I can't remember exactly where, but I do remember it was a barn. And um, I remember I went up there one night, and uh, the Terminators were up there working out, and. Um, uh, I can't remember all the guys, but but the Lumbee Warrior, he was there, and um, and so yes. I went up there and trained with them, and and told Ken, you know, and and Ken's like, okay, we we got a show in a couple weeks, but 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 when I was training with them, I had already started training somewhere else, and I was just trying to find some place closer to home versus me driving two hours to train, but um, but in any event, um, the I, I worked out with him for a couple weeks, and then Ken's like, okay, I, I, he he's like, you know your stuff, so. I got this this young kid, uh, the Lumbee Warrior, um, and I I think that <laughs> that uh, you guys would uh, work great together. And I said, okay, cool, sounds good to me. So I have the first match with Lumbee Warrior, and uh, it's in Thomasville. And you know how the Thomasville crowd can be; they they, they get a little rowdy. And uh, but I didn't know <laughs> that the Lumbee Warrior had like his whole family there. And 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 it just so happened the finish of the match. I'm the heel; he's the baby face. The finish of the match is I pull the legs, put my feet on the top, put my feet on the middle rope, one, two, three, roll out of the ring, raise my hand in victory. And as soon as I did, boom, I got hit with a chair. <laughs> and it was like his his mom <laughs> or his grandma or somebody, but they like threw a chair at me. Um, and then like the whole front row started coming at me. And I'm looking, I'm like, okay, all these Native Americans are about to, to kill me. And I remember two Thomasville cops came over, got they got in between me, and just took me out of there as fast as they could. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I didn't even do anything, <laughs> get no heat. This is great. And the crazy thing was, at that point in time, I hadn't really been in the business, but, like, maybe maybe a year, if that. So that was, like, my, my, first, um, my, my, my first experience with heat. And I was like, I think I can do this. This, this, this is pretty fun. But – Working Lumby, even then he was he was green, but uh, man, he was so easy to work to work with. He really was. Yeah, Lumby is uh, in- incredible. Um, always was a good hand. Some of the hardest chops in the business. Um, I, I worked Lumby probably over a hundred times, uh, in whether it be in tags or singles, and. Mm-hmm. Um, always enjoyed it. uh he's incredible um i tried to to get him to come back to do some of the shows that we have coming up as a matter of fact oh that would be great and um uh yeah it would be he's not gonna do it but oh, too bad. <laughs> but but, it, but it, uh it, it would be fantastic he had um thought a, a little while ago about doing another run and um uh thought better of it <laughs> later yeah, you know the the one thing I remember so much about Lumby is how how like humble he was. I mean, he's such a humble guy. And, yes, and uh, you, you don't get that very much incredible. in this business. Um, as a matter of fact, I think the last time I saw him, um, 
was I think the USIWF was running like a benefit show up in uh, Poff Town. This was probably about six or seven years ago. And um, I believe you might have been on that show, but um, but Lumby was there. Yes. He, he didn't work, but he was there. And I remember um, he was over running a concession stand, and uh, he yelled at me. And I went over there, and he's like, oh, brother, I haven't seen you. And, and, he, and he was telling some of the guys around that was there with us, like, oh, it was um, – Grease Monkey, I think, was his name, but he was talking to Grease, and he was like, "You know, brother, uh, terrific Tony, I I had him in my first match, and he's like, and it, and, it, and it was so easy and so fun." I said, "Yeah, it was fun for you, but not for me when your whole family attacked me." <laughs> and he started laughing. He was, "Oh, my family loves me, man." <laughs> I just thought that was a great story, you know how how, oh, absolutely. how how he remembered that and 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 you know and thanked me for it, even you know, and th- th- I guess by that time it'd probably been fifteen years since our first match together and, and, and he still remembered it. And I thought that was, that was really cool. Yeah. He has a, um, uh, luckily he, uh, escaped without, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, memory loss problems and things like that. But, uh, Lumby has a, uh, uncanny mind for the wrestling business. He would make, uh, a, a great, uh, booker somewhere. If, um, he decided that he that he ever wanted to do that thing. He was a, uh, um, I don't know if you would say maybe an assistant to Ken. I was about uh, to but, say uh, I he, remembered that that he was. Yeah, he um, he drove Ken around a lot and um, uh, definitely came up in the business the right way. Learned a, a tremendous amount um, from Ken. I feel confident, and um, you know very very talented guy um always good to work with very giving um tough double tough um mm-hmm. he's a tough guy yeah you know? yeah um the show you were uh speaking of was the um patty frederico memorial show that's it yes up in pop town mm-hmm. and uh that was a great and show. i worked um willie g and uh wendell smooth on that show and it was a fantastic show good night mm-hmm. um you know, paying tribute to uh, uh, a great lady. Yeah, yeah. And for, I, I didn't know her that well, but from, but from the stories I was told by other people, she really loved wrestling. Oh, she did. She um, uh, was very passionate. Um, of course, her husband wrestled. Both of her sons wrestled. And uh, we had um, Evan, her youngest son, um uh, doing spots in the ring when he was 10 years old. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And, uh, she would be, uh, just absolutely hilarious. He wore, um, uh, atomic Freddy. Was, atomic Freddy. Uh, yeah. I was about husband. to say. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, he did a, a mass gimmick called, um, Fuego Demente. Okay. And, um, Evan, because of the, the, his, his build, he, he you know, it was a squat kid. Mm hmm. And he wore a hood, and um, he was uh, El Gaito. Okay. And we hooked up with him, and, um, you know, people thought that he was a midget wrestler. And he wasn't. He was just a 10-year-old kid, you know. (laughs) And uh, we used him as our flag bearer, and we used to abuse him. And uh, we would do shows at that VFW on Glen Avenue. And we were doing you know, spots with him at 10 years old where we're, you know, very protected, but we're giving him power bombs and mm-hmm. things like that. And, and Patty will be in the third row yelling, Joe Storm, if you hurt my baby, I'm going to whip your ass. <laughs> and, uh, uh, fantastic. Ooh, um, and his, uh, older brother, of course, wrestled, uh, he is, uh, my, my primary tag partner now in storm legacy, but, uh, he started at, 14 um working in front of crowds and mm-hmm. fly white guy and um also you know incredible guy so we you know we come up with um these guys and um uh, later if you want i'll i'll talk to you about the storm legacy thing and what that was originally supposed to be it's mm-hmm. something very different than it the uh original uh incarnation but, yeah and and you know you 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 bring up these names and um I, i'll tell you the cool thing whenever i was training up there with ken uh th- all, all those guys were there training with me you know at the, at the time 
uh, which 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 was really cool that that you know to see I you know because of my work schedule and stuff I wasn't able to stay there with Ken I went back to the other place but um but you know I, I would see him for the, in the, the only shows and I'm like man I remember that that kid was in was at wrestling camp when I was there and I knew that that uh you know he, he was hungry and he had the potential to to uh, he, he was a quick learner at the time I could I could I could pick up on that um and now to see that he's part of uh part of uh the storm legacy um it just you know just solidifies what, you know, what I thought at, at that wrestling camp you know with, with Ken outstanding um now uh, g- getting back to ken and uh working for him so um so like like were uh, you working for ken the whole time uh like up 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 until he switched over to the uh, ndw with chris plano uh yes um when when i came in um when we were still training um I, I I don't know like some of the uh, inner business relationships between Chris and Ken, but at, at that time they were um, just about to switch over. If my memory serves me, and again I have been hitting the head a lot, so I'm sure Chris can tell you a whole lot better timeline wise. Mm-hmm. But um, Chris was doing ring announcing at that point for Ken, right, and. Um, as I say, my, my first tag team partner um, uh, was the guy I worked the MS with. His name was um, Roy Hayes. He went by uh, the Reaper R.T. Hayes. Okay. And we, we were a, a tag team called Extreme Trauma. And, uh, you know, we came in, um, like our first introduction in front of the crowd was in Thomasville. And boy, was that, Thomasville is like no other place on the face of the planet. Nope. No. Um, they they have some of the most actually I will say this they had the most passionate wrestling fans some of the craziest wrestling fans and some straight up loons down there but <laughs> That's um, the truth. and and ironically enough the most passionate uh, you know generally tends to be uh, family of the wrestlers uh, mm-hmm. as you talked about your experience with Lumbee yep. and things like that so our our first introduction in front of the crowd was just um, doing an uh, uh, interview on um, one of the shows that, uh, and Chris was conducting the interview. And, um, you know, of course, we were green as goose shit. We had not done anything in front of the crowd. Um, You know, starting to learn um, probably okay, you know, (laughs) introductory wrestlers or whatever. So we go out and we and we do this thing and we're we're doing an interview and uh, back then very much unlike you know what the things you see on TV and things like that you were given perhaps bullet points but interviews were not scripted your promos were stuff you did you may be told okay I want you to hit on this this and this in the promo but it, it was generally you just going out and doing your thing come from your heart and um, mm-hmm. yes absolutely. And, um, you know, Chris is doing the interview and, and he's like, well, why are you here? And I believe at this point they were already, um, NDW by the time we got in front of the crowd. Okay. And, um, and, and, uh, and again, I'm sure Chris can tell you better timeline wise, but so Chris is doing this interview and, and, you know, we did this real indie geek promo we're here to face the best competition and and uh uh, of course you know our our ultimate goal is to become tag team champions and 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 chris was like um so you're getting for the tag team champions or something to that regard and uh i was totally caught off guard by the question Mm -hmm. And, and i was like uh 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 you know one of those things Right. I'm, I'm I'm sure if there is video that exists of it, it, it was pretty crappy. And um, then we did um, prepare the, like the first match we had. It was also in Thomasville. It was like a ten man tag, and um, and it was just guys from the school, um, uh, myself and uh, Roy. Our first match. 
Tommy Steele's first match. Uh, his original tag team partner uh, was a guy named Ricky Baker, who uh, worked as Iron Man. He was in there. Um, and then some guys that, that did like some preliminary work for him. Uh, while Bill Armstrong, I think Alan Reed was in that match. Yep. Um, and uh, a couple of those guys, and it was just this cookie cutter trying to figure out all the stuff we learned in training kind of match. Mm-hmm. And then um, second match was um, a, a six-man tag with part of the same people. Um, Wendell Smooth was uh, had come in around that time. And he may have already been training when we started. He was definitely in the, the, the six-man tag. And then um, talk about trial by fire. The third show that we ever did, um, we did a, uh, a gauntlet, if you want to call it that, with uh, uh, Tommy Steele first, mm-hmm. then uh, my partner, uh, Roy Hayes and then myself against uh, it individually against the Beastmaster Rick Link. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And um, you want to talk about trial by fire. It was, it was incredible. Um, Rick is, you know, a legend in these parts. And mm-hmm. uh, I love Beast to death. He is a great guy. Um, true backstory to this day, he is the only person that has ever uh, gigged me in a match. He's the only person I've ever allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so third match, we're going out there. You know, Tommy goes out. It's Thomasville. They love Rick Lincoln Thomas. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was Crowd there. is crazy. Tommy goes out. Rick beats the shit out of it. Mm -hmm. Tommy comes back through the curtain. They're already playing um, whatever, you know, music we were using at the time. Roy's going to the ring. Ken is sitting in a chair in the back dressing room. Tommy comes in. He is absolutely covered in blood. He walks over to Ken. Ken's wearing a white shirt. He's got blood on his hands. He puts his hands on Ken's chest and goes, look what you did to me <laughs> hilarious i look out the curtain and roy is getting the ever-living shit kicked out of him right mm-hmm. and i'm like oh my god <laughs> what have we got ourselves into here you know right and then sure. he, he dispatches roy and um uh, and then my music hits and i i go out there and I have um, the utmost respect for Rick. Again, I love Rick Lee, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you part of the reason that I do. Not just the fact that, that throughout the course of time, I had some, some pretty cool matches with him and things like that. But Rick was an absolute professional because Rick, had he chose to, chose to could have really, really hurt us. Oh, you know? yeah, for sure. And, um... You know, I go in and I'm, you know, we're we're doing the thing, and I, I guess you know, uh, I I listen to your podcast with Chris, and you know, with the internet today, and you know, this thing that used to be ours is, is very public. Um, oh yeah. So <laughs> I guess there there's no way to break case aid anymore. So um, I go to the ring and um, Rick's calling spots for me, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so he does the thing, and and um, and, and he's like, uh, you know, go to the top, brother, and or you know, and so I go up, and I'm I'm working him, and um, he juices, and he's like, work the blood, brother, and so I'm I'm pounding him, and I guess I'm I'm probably potatoing the shit out of it because mm-hmm. he's like, damn, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I'm working the blood, and he said, okay, jump down, and uh spread your legs and uh so i hop down and I spread my legs and he kicks me right in the nuts oh and, no uh, <laughs> he chucks me out to the floor and uh in true beastmaster fashion um hits me with about a dozen chair shots you know 
some to the head, some to the back. He uh, spins me around. He goes, here we go. He works the gimmick on my head. I'm leading, you know, um, some people that we've worked with in EMS were there. I've got this on video. Uh, well, it's on this now, but uh, you can hear them, like, going ape shit near the camera. Mm-hmm. Get the fuck off him. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. You. Uh, but, you know, get off of him and and all of this stuff. And it was uh, absolutely fantastic. And uh, and then, you know, through, through the course of uh, we gained some experience. I worked with Rick several times. Uh, a true regret that I have is um, we had talked several years ago about um, working each other on some shows again. Uh, we about had the opportunity at um, some car lot show that, excuse me, Tim Blaze was doing uh-huh. something happened and it fell through and now his health is to the point where he can't work anymore. Oh, that's too uh, bad. He and, yeah, um, uh, uh, Rick does dialysis now and uh, um, it just it turned out not to be in the cards but he and uh, I and Corey Edsel had, uh, you know, talked about doing like a uh, three-way Norris Bob Wire match a while back. And and uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that I really regret that, um, you know, things happen medically-wise that, that not necessarily, I'm by no means am I saying that I am uh, regret not being able to do Norris Bob Wire again. But, mm-hmm. uh <laughs> The, the opportunity to uh, work with him again, because I, again, um, I know opinions may vary, but uh, I dig Rick. Uh, I have the utmost respect for him. He taught me a lot during my early career. And um, every time I worked with him, even though the matches were, were tough, because back then it was very different than it is today. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, uh, and a little bit wild. Um, he always took care of me and mm-hmm. always appreciated that. So, yeah. uh, Rick's a good guy. And you know, uh, I, all the way around. And you know, I've, I've, I worked a couple of shows with him, you know, when I was working for Ken, but, um, you know, when I done my podcast with Chris, Chris was telling me how, you know, Rick was like his right hand man that no, nobody knew that, but he was. And, and Rick, you know, Rick helped Chris a lot and you say the same thing. So I, I haven't, I, over my years of talking to people that have discussed Rick link, I haven't heard anybody say anything bad about him at all. Yeah, I've got, you know, consummate professional. Yeah. You know, always. Now, uh... But, um... Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was, I was going to say, uh, so now, how how long did, uh, you did, uh, now... Uh, I can't try and think of my question. Okay, so as far as N- NDW goes, did uh, you work for them all the way up until they shut down, or, or, or did you kind of leave after a while, or... How that? How that? Um, we we worked with um, Chris until the split. Okay. And um, I I don't remember, and I may uh, it may be something I forgot, but you know I I wasn't a uh, at that time it in in a position to be involved with the politics of wrestling and right yeah and yeah. things like that. But we we had um. We, we worked with uh, NDW when they first started uh, touring. I think Chris um, had mentioned, you know, that that they had done some touring. We didn't do California with them or anything like that. But uh, when they were doing the uh, the fair circuits, um, the States were fair, which was always a good time. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, some of that, that video is, uh, is some of the stuff that you can find on NDW on uh, YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, a, a, a little known thing with a, if, if there's a, a video on YouTube of the States Will Fair where we um, were doing this battle oil and um, they did voiceover commentary several months after the uh, the States Will event. Mm-hmm. But in Chris's commentary, uh, he calls Roy and I the Storm Brothers, and that was actually several months before the Storm Brothers existed, and by that time, boy, had already left wrestling, but I always thought that was funny, that uh, 
that that he had the the spoiler of things to come oh, and that's, uh that's great and, and stuff like that but um uh at some point uh Ken and Chris split mm-hmm. and uh I can't give you any uh like inside dirt on that because I honestly don't know what what happened there um like I say I may have known a little bit at the time but I doubt it um they they uh broke off for whatever reason um we were Ken Spence guys, so uh, a lot of the guys went with uh, Ken. And I, I think there were there was um, a time um, where after the split, it, like they were running two show two shows a month in Thomasville. Like Ken Ken would run a show, and a couple of weeks later, Chris would run a show, and and. Um, uh, I, again, I don't, uh, remember a lot of details. Um, Brad Stutz, who, uh, booked for CWF for a long time back in those days, he was just like a fan and he used to come to all the NDW events and, mm-hmm. and, uh, they were huge Rick Link fans and they had this little thing called the um, Parker, Parker fan club. And, um, they come to the things, but Brad had told me a, a funny story many years later. That um, I, he may have known more about the split, I guess, than than we were concerned with at the time or whatever. Right. They would do um, pre-sales at the Thomasville flea market for the NDW shows, and um, Brad and I hadn't saw each other in a long time, and we kind of reconnected. And, and by that time, he had started doing some stuff in the wrestling business. Um, he managed uh, Corey Edsel when he first started. So we, we kind of reconnected on a, a different ACW show. Uh, by that time, they were uh, alternative championship wrestling. Yeah. So they may have changed to APW at that time. They were always alternative, but they may have changed to APW. But Brad was telling me, he was like, you know, during that time, and, and he spoke of the stuff like that there was a lot of legitimate heat going on there. Again, not anything that, that I can recall or being a big part of, um, other than one incident at, uh, at a show in Napoli, but, and, and he talked about how they used to go to the flea market to sell tickets. And he was always petrified that, uh, Damien and I were going to come down there and beat him up, Oh no! you know, cause I, I guess this, this was a, a bigger thing than I remember it being anyway. Again, I've been hitting the head a whole lot, but, mm-hmm. um, I know that there was some animosity in the split. Um, later down the line, we were uh, doing a show at the Boys and Girls Club in High Point, and they did like this little um, NDW invasion night. And uh, Plano and Justin Beach, I'm pretty sure it was Justin, um, kind of hit the ring and they started cutting this promo and we're in the back and uh the guys were like plano and them are in the ring plano and them are in the ring and everybody's kind of looking around so we all go out we're kind of surrounding the ring and i'm looking at the the people around me and i'm like is this a shoot i mean is this a thing Mm -hmm. uh that's going on here and um basically they're they're cutting a promo and um and you know, challenging everybody. Well, you know, it's a whole locker room of us, and and everybody's, you know, even though we're, you know, posturing for the crowd, we're like discussing among ourselves: is, is this real, or is this, you know, part of the show mm-hmm. that we haven't been told about, or something? And uh, I think uh, Danny Fritz, Mister Excellent, ended up getting in the ring, and Danny was a martial artist, and he starts throwing spin kicks not to them in the air and stuff and right. they they finally got out of the ring and and um uh, again i think i think later uh, again chris would, would know way more about this than i do I, I think later um i connected with uh chris uh over the internet because we had we got into a point where we were taking a lot more outside bookings and uh you know i, I touched uh touch base with him and um uh and inquired about 
maybe coming back to do some NDW stuff. And, um, uh, I, I, again, I think that he had mentioned that, you know, there was a whole lot of animosity between the groups and, and that, uh, perhaps, um, that was something planned that the, the locker room wasn't told about. So it turned into something totally different. And, uh, and we did, and and I will say this, which was uh, shows our immaturity in the business at the time. We did, you know, take digs at them on shows. Mm-hmm. Um, the first weapons match we did in Arcadia, we wore um, uh, the first fans bring the weapons match oh, uh, nice. that we did in Arcadia. We we won. Uh, we wore. Um, uh, uh, Chris had real good merch. Oh, for yeah. the time, yeah. you know, he was, he was doing incredible stuff that other people wasn't doing. And we had a couple of the NDW, um, I think the tour was called hot summer nights that we'd done the summer before probably. And, you know, we had wrote like NDW, you know, it had the NDW wrestling logo on the front. We'd wrote sucks across it and, and, you know, all this stupid shit that mm-hmm. in, in reality, Tony probably was not the best thing for uh for us business wise uh when i say us, i'm talking about me and my brother mm-hmm. and things like that because when we reconnected he was like well you know i'll consider it you know it's never good to burn bridges and um and that was 100 percent correct you know again that we i feel like we did that i don't regret a lot of stuff that we we did by any means uh i don't regret any of it i just i think that showed our immaturity in the business at the time you know uh we were very very cocky and really didn't give a shit but we also wasn't thinking long term about um business you know right yeah and as as we got out more and we started traveling and and hitting all these various promotions and stuff um we we kind of uh you know grew out of that uh singular promotion mentality and we started to travel and make make a name for ourselves other places mm-hmm. and um and because of that uh gained a whole lot more notoriety made a whole lot more money and um we probably could have made good money had we We'd done some stuff again with ndw and um i hate it i love the time that uh we spent with ndw um we learned a lot. Uh, they had, uh, as Chris was talking about in this podcast, they brought in a ton of talent. Um, we were exposed to so much um, during their relationship together, and and you know, uh, and and those things. So, um, I hate NDW doesn't exist. Um, I think they that you know he had talked about he'd never say never. Uh, when we started running and we started doing like our little um, Hall of Honor thing, I'd reached out to Chris about uh, coming in um, because we always did those, at, you know, the Thomasville gimmick on Thanksgiving night yeah. and all that. Mm-hmm. And um, and he was like, "Well, I'll consider it, but you know, not this year." And and uh, unfortunately, after that last one, there wasn't a next year. Okay. But um, so. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's what I remember about NDW. They they were doing things at the time no other independent promotion was doing, whether mm-hmm. it be advertising, the quality of talent they were using. Um, you know, Matt and Jeff were uh, Hardy were coming in then as uh, Surge and Willow the Wish, and they had just started doing enhancement work on WWE TV, and they had the PowerPoint guys coming in and. Um, a, a ton of exposure um, during that time period as we were coming up. I met a lot of old vets, a lot of people that I were, was fans of growing up, which is the, the cool thing about the wrestling business, you oh, know? Yeah. And um, so, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I remember about our NDW time. Yeah. Um, what, what, uh, like, you know, now Chris and I are really good friends, but I, I would, I, I've told him several times, I said, man, I said, my, my regret is I never got to work for NDW, and uh, he's like, yeah. He said, he said that 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 would have been fun. 
He said, but at the time, you were kind of like comp- my competition because you were running shows over here and I was over there. I was like, yeah. So, but like, like at the time, he was running, uh, NEW was in Thomasville, and I was running my shows in High Point. I had a little bar deal that, that I was doing, and I was happy with that because I didn't have to pay no rent on uh, on any buildings. Um, I just show up, bring my ring to this bar, and run a show and have a good time and, and make money. And um so I was kind of like a whole different product than, than what he had. Um, but he was way bigger than what I was doing too. And, um, he was very successful at it. And, and I keep telling him every time I talk to him, like, Hey, we, you, you, you need to bring Andy W back. Just one show. It's all it's going to take one show is all it's going to take. He goes, yeah, 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 I know. And, uh, and he's real close, but I, he's, he's just so busy with, with his shoot job. I just don't, I don't see him being able to, to, to do it. And, and and I think Chris is such a perfectionist, um, and he wants to do everything the right way. I, I believe he feels like that he's been out of the loop of wrestling so long that it's changed so much that maybe the things that he knew may not work now. Um, but I, I disagree. I, I think I think if um, I, as as successful and as as he was, um, I think if he if he done if he got back into wrestling business, I think he would be just just as successful if not more, because now, kind of like what he and I talked about on the podcast, back when he was running NDW, um, there wasn't no internet. You know, it was just, you put posters up, you, you, you rent a, or you rent an ad in the paper, uh, and that, and that was the, and word of mouth, and that was pretty much your, your way of getting the word out. Now, with the internet and Facebook and all that, man, I, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how, how, um, how it is. But, getting back to, to, to when you started, um, Back then, there really wasn't a lot of promotions running around uh, this area. You know, you mentioned um, um, ACW. I remember going to a lot of their shows, and um, you know, and and they 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 would bring in a lot of talent too, just like Chris would do. Um, you know, absolutely. I remember going going to their shows and thinking, man, um, this is like Crockett all over again because they'd have Wahoo and and Jimmy Valiant and um, the Freebirds and Rockwell Express and and ron garvin and and uh man and you know it'd be like the whole show would be a name you know or i'm sorry there'd be a name like in every match um yeah and 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 then of course they they would still have their guys like mad dog davidson and tim blaze and the heart heart heartbreak express and the guys like that but um but man those those shows were you know i i enjoyed that i as a, even as, as a worker i'd go to those shows and watch them and i enjoyed it because it was just like it was like the old days all over again Oh, absolutely. Um, the, I, I think the biggest uh, difference, uh, well, to touch back on the Plano thing, uh, the one thing, if he decides he wants to listen to this, that uh, I would hope he would take into consideration if he decided to do just a show, um, is, uh, you know, Chris has got a good mind for the business, and I think mm-hmm. he can maximize the social media thing. I think the Internet's probably been our biggest blessing and our biggest curse combined yeah. for the wrestling industry. But, um, this, Chris, if you're listening, nostalgia sells. So uh, run that show and book the storms. But, um, and Terrific Tony. Uh, the bit, and, and Terrific Tony, <laughs> definitely, and Terrific Tony. Mm. And, and his partner, and we'll work him. That'll be great. Yeah, if um, I can find one. But, uh, uh, I'm sure you can find somebody. Tony, you know everybody. Yeah, this is true. Um, but, uh, the the biggest difference between um sorry about that my headset kicked in for oh, some reason that's cool. um, and I'm not wearing it but uh um the biggest difference between ACW and NDW was probably the in my opinion the production values of the product mm-hmm. you know ACW did TV um they they did well for what was at the time. Chris was doing something totally different. Uh, the setup of his shows, the feel, the ACW shows were more gritty, Crockett like. Chris's shows were more, um, I guess, modern for the time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you were sitting when you were talking about the guys from ACW. I was actually sitting there with a smile on my face, and I don't smile a lot. Um, I, I love that era and that time period and um uh loved working for uh uh jerry and robbie uh good basic w group of guys a good group of guys uh talented that's where i first met uh 
Randolph Hedrick and uh you know, uh, I'd known Tim for a little while, L.A. Wild one and mm, Brian oh, Lewis, LA. uh, and later uh, uh, his partner, Pat Friday. We mm-hmm. had some absolute wars, a lot of good times, a few bad times in there. I still love you, Pat. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, an incredible group of guys. And um, during that time period, uh, this is kind of off topic of the promotions, but, um, but through Ken – I met the most wonderful lady on the face of the planet. Actually, it was a combination of ladies, but um, uh, Emily Miller. And uh, Emily was a standard at independent shows um, when she was still with us. Mm -hmm. And through Emily, I was introduced to Greg Price. But um, Emily did a, uh, you know, maybe not, uh, on the career end, but she opened a lot of doors uh, for me with um, older talent. It was through Emily that I met Wahoo and uh, Jack Briscoe, as a matter of fact. And um, again, introduced me to Greg Price. Um, and through Greg, I met a tremendous amount of people, or through the combination of the two of them. Uh, spent one crazy ass day with Rob Van Dam and, uh, and, and those things. But, um, Emily was uh, as big a part of the uh, the scene at that time as some of the wrestlers, uh, more so than people realize. And uh, sweet lady, I miss her every day. Um, wish she was still with us. And uh, her buddy Patsy, who uh, it's, it's my understanding is, is still doing helping out around AML and things like that. But um, uh, but. Uh, again, it was through those guys and through through ACW and uh, and to NDW to a degree, but definitely Ken Spence on his shows that uh, that I met the people and got the opportunity to work with some of and work on shows with all of those Crockett people that I grew up when I was young. You know, Ivan and Wahoo mm-hmm. and um, and uh, those various guys. And uh, but uh, during that time. You're right. There wasn't a tremendous amount of promotions. Not like it is today, where there's a school on every corner and mm-hmm. a promotion on every corner. But you had um, Ken and Chris in the Thomasville area, and um, after they split, I think Ken went back to using the Carolina Wrestling Association name. Um, you had uh, ACW, who was um, uh, the Asheboro area. The, um, they did some stuff in the in the High Point area, uh, Roxboro. Um, around that same time period, um, there were uh, there was a guy up in uh, Mount Airy uh, or somewhere near the Mount Airy area named uh, Bobby Seacrease. Bobby Seacrease, yeah. Always running some shows. Um, Bobby was a interesting guy. You know, we we talked off there about uh, mm-hmm. Bobby. Some of the the he had he. Had, uh, passionate fans some of the worst paydays on the history of the planet you know never never got your money right and uh but but back then you know it was all about paying your dues and then later um yeah dynamite doug uh running mount airy armory um bobby secrets always ran a school yeah and, um, uh, speaking of mount airy did uh you ever work for those i think they were called the bingham brothers uh, we we did a couple of shows for them, but we we were by no means regulars on their events. Yeah, yeah, I, I worked a few shows for them, but I remember the ring being so so horrible. It was like it was an old ring, and then for padding, they had like um, it was like uh, foam rubber that were like yes. going cushions. And I remember I was working this one guy, and he's like, "Hey, brother, throw me out." I'm like, "Why?" He goes, "Cause I want to take a bump on something harder than this ring." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." Absolutely. Like we, we worked a uh, a show in High Point, um, and I think that was for ACW, perhaps. And the ring that they had rented um, was the hardest ring I've ever been in, and and a lot of the young guys don't understand this about the rings back then, especially the, uh, the old wooden rings. Oh my gosh. Um, um, that, that, you know, it was literally like bumping on the floor of the house, mm-hmm. you know, metal ring posts, everything else built like a floor. 
very little padding and things like that. And um, we um, we uh, were we're doing spots, and uh, I was working. I think Rob McBride, and uh, he gives me a hip toss in this ring, and that's the first thing I said to him. I was like, throw me out. Why? I'm not bumping in this ring. And we go out and we do the rest of the match on the floor and literally being slammed on that concrete floor was better than that ring. And when, when we walk out, you know, uh, I'm sure you've been in High Point's Armory. He's got that big roll-up door. The ring trailer was out there. Uh-huh. Every bit of padding was still rolled up and sitting on that trailer. They had no padding at all on that ring. Oh, my Freaking gosh. Freaking ridiculous. Yes. But, but um, and then there was uh, some guys that ran down east, um, the Johnsons, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, um, Ken Johnson, who wrestled as, um, Kim Fox, um, they ran a CWA, they were Carolina Wrestling Alliance. Okay. And that was, that was it, um, as far as I know. And then later, uh, John Gowen started running some shows and then you had, you know, people popping up here and there again nothing like it is today but you know opportunities you have more people running shows and uh and uh those things but yeah it wasn't it's it's not like it is today where there was an independent show uh or with a different promotion running you know uh successive nights and things like that mm-hmm. you know well, we're running the same nights and until much a little bit later yeah well you know one of the things i remember back at back in the 90s when i was started um you know it worked you worked for ken um and i, I work i worked for jeff um but at, and the bingham brothers so i could i if if, if i did it right I, I could work every weekend somewhere but yes but on but on an average you know, back in those days, um, you might you might wrestle twice a month. You know, every other weekend. You know, um, if 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 you were only working for one promoter. Uh, but now, yes. but nowadays, um, you can, you can look and, and there's at least ten to fifteen shows every Saturday that you could get booked on if if you could put yourself out there because there's just so many of them around now. Yeah, there are, and then by 98 um mid-98 there there was uh opportunities and i think uh you and chris touched on that about um uh the double shots right yes now Mm -hmm. it's it's real weird to me because um i saw a quote on the uh the the facebook thing today where a guy said you know um, the landscape of wrestling and the traditions are changing. And, um, they were, they were talking essentially about disgruntled vets and, and uh-huh. crap like that. But, um, uh, one of the things I hate is when people misuse terminology and, and today oh, yeah. when guys, uh, talk about, um, double shot weekends, they're talking about working, um, you know, a show on Friday, a show on Saturday, and that's not double shot. Double no. shot is exactly what you guys were talking about, and and uh, luckily, um, and I don't know if that was Chris or with Ken, um, but uh, once we started traveling some, and get, we had the CWA guys down at the coast, it was not uncommon for us to um, come in. We would uh, set up the, the gimmick table, and my wife and uh, uh Damien's wife, um, well, later they were our wives, but our, our, probably our girlfriends at that time. Um, they would set up the gimmick table and they would work the gimmick table until bell time. And we would open the show or first or second match, no later than third match. We would come out of the ring, walk. By that time, they'd already broke down the gimmick table. It was loaded. Mm-hmm. We'd already taken our bags out before the match. We would go in, do the do the thing, boom, 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 finish the match, walk in the back. Thank uh but you know, thank the dudes we're working with, uh, you know, get our pay envelope, walk out the side door into a running car, not change clothes. Mm-hmm. Jump in, full gear, haul ass 
to go down to main event in Roseboro or, or Hobson or, or something like that. And um, by that time, we, we had worked ourselves up to where we, we definitely were not working open match, second match, or undercard. We were, by that time, we an upper card, semi-main, mm-hmm. or when we hooked up with the Terminators and things like that, working the main. And, uh, and the reverse, the Johnsons were always real good to us in that sense, too. You know, if, if we needed to, we could go down there, open, and then make it back to Thomasville if need be to do something in the upper car. So, young children, that is a true double shot where you're working multiple shows on the same day. The same day. Yeah. Um, the same day. But um, later, but you know, by 98, um, we had, we had already started to travel some and, and we're getting out. And, um, you know, by that time for us, if you, you, you could work, um, frequently if you're willing to do the traveling and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, so we were, we were doing, you know, uh, we would do a rare Wednesday, but you know, we would do a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, you know, an occasional Sunday, and then um, in the joyous times when we we would do loops, you know, we would do a, a Friday, and then uh, back in the day, it was also very popular, uh, you know, mobile home dealerships were a big thing in car dealerships. Oh, where yeah. They would sell these shows. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we would work uh, somewhere on Friday, and then um, if we were lucky, it was somewhere local. If we weren't, it would be like Kentucky where we, you know, get out of the ring and drive through, you know, a good part of the night to get back. And then we had to be at the, the mobile home place or the car dealership by 10 a.m. And, you know, you, you, if that was the two show gimmick, right? You do a show about 11, 1130, and then you do another show at two o'clock. And then, um, like our, our, probably our roughest loop we did um uh uh, there was a promotion in kentucky that was owned by a car salesman ironically and they did a tv show called fire on the mountain friday nights so we had gone to pikeville kentucky uh that was well after ken and plano had split Mm -hmm. um but we we did um a tv tape and that was like the 16 to 18 match because they were they were doing essentially months worth of TV in a night. Okay. And um, and uh, Barry Wyndham and uh, Dustin Rhodes post Gold Dust after his first Gold Dust run when mm-hmm. he went to the Indies or whatever. Um, they uh they were on the top of that thing, and we worked in the middle, and that was the second weapons match. That was uh, Damien and I and Tommy and Wendell. And um, we did weapons for that TV tape in that night. And then we drove through the night. And then we did a um, mobile home thing Saturday. So we did the two shows Saturday morning, then afternoon. Then that night we went to the Mount Airy Armory and we worked for uh, Dynamite Doug's promotion. I can't remember what it is, so if Doug happens to listen, I apologize that I don't remember the promotion. But he he did some cool shows where he brought in a lot of names. And um, we did that thing, and then Sunday we had a show in Roxburgh for ACW or probably APW at that time. We worked uh, uh, L.A. and Pat uh, as the New Heartbreak Express, and we did a, a cage match that Sunday. You know, so there there were times in there where if you wanted to stay busy, you could. You just you had to be willing to put in the miles. For yeah, and and you know a, a lot of the guys then and probably a lot of them now, um, I think that that's one of their downfalls. They they don't want to travel. They uh, just want to you know wrestle in their hometown and and get their little family pop and and go back home. And uh, unfortunately, pro wrestling is a whole lot more than that. You got to. I mean, you 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 drive a lot. You miss a lot. Um, I know uh, there's a lot of wrestlers that I know <laughs> that this wrestling business has cost them marriages and homes and things like that. But you know, it, 
if if you stay dedicated to it, um, you know, everything weeds out. Um, I always say, but um, you know, I, I've I've said some in other podcasts. Pro wrestling is is kind of like a um, it's like the mob. Once you're in, you're in, um, and it's like a drug too. When once you get it, it's hard to stop. Um, I'm coming up on my 27th year uh, in this business, and I'm uh, you know I look back over the years, and I'm like, wow, has it really been that long? Because it it doesn't seem like it's been that long because the years have went by so fast, but there's so many memories and like you say there's so many things that i've got to do um since i since i got into wrestling that i didn't think i'd ever get to do um you, you know you talked about mid-atlantic wrestling well growing up you know at rock express they were to say they were hot would, would be an understatement i mean they, these guys were you know as big as the you know kind of like now or you know before when you watch watch wwe and, you, and you'd see the rock and stone cold those guys were huge stars but if you go back and look at the days of the Rockwell Express and the Midnight Express, uh, you know, wrestling the Charlotte Coliseum and the Greensboro Coliseum, I would venture to say they were probably more, at the time they were probably more popular than than I would say Stone Cold and um, and The Rock would be. Wouldn't you think? Uh, definitely, um, at least on uh, regional levels. Right. Yeah. Um, um, the the one thing that. Uh, WWF slash WWE, what, whatever they want to be today. Uh, you know, the, they highlighted nationally, and, and Crockett tried to do that expansion and things too, but um, in the the times of the territories with, um, you know, everyone in Texas knew who the Von Erichs was, and everyone in the Carolinas knew who the Rock and Roll Express was, and mm-hmm. Memphis in Georgia and, and things like that. Um, it was a whole, a totally different landscape as far as where the business was at that time and, and, um, how the business was protected. And it truly, it was a whole lot more violent during that time period for the, for the yeah. wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, that's one thing that, um, wrestling today lacks and, um, will never get back. Um, Someone, perhaps Jim Cornette, uh, you know, once said, once the toothpaste out of the tube, you can't put it back in. Right. And, um, you know, the majority of people knew, you know, there was probably something just that wasn't exactly right about pro wrestling. But until someone, truly someone of authority come out and told them, eh, you know, it's not on the up and up where these mm-hmm. guys aren't really trying to kill each other. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, that totally changes the landscape, but fans were, um, invested and it's, it's harder to find that now you can still find it in Thomasville, North Carolina, because those fans are still rabid. But, yes. um, in, in most places wrestling lacks when, when, uh, wrestling allowed, a lot of the interaction between the, the wrestlers and the fans. Again, internet, big blessing, horrible mm-hmm. curse. Mm-hmm. Um, once that veil was lifted and the access became the normal thing, um, the, the fans were way more emotionally invested in the product that they were presented. Um, you know, we... Uh, whether it was NDW or ACW uh, back then, again, it was more gritty because, um, yeah, you know, I, I remember a very vividly a time in this business. Um, when we first started traveling around, we traveled a lot with, uh, Tommy Steele and Wendell Smooth. Mm-hmm. And we, even though we rode together, when we got close to the cities, these guys are, are ducking down in the back seat and we were not allowed to eat together. If, if we did a show, um, even back then, if we did a show down towards the coast, we would not even stop and eat together until we hit Raleigh. You know, um, when, when it, it was just a different time. Now the guys are out in front of the fans congratulating each other on a great match and, and things that um and posting back on Facebook. then was very much a and yeah posting on everything today is on facebook and, and you know i'll stop and, you for a second right there because because that that's something that that really to me I'm, 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 I'm gonna get your opinion on like i see a lot sure. of guys on facebook 
and say say I'm, I'm gonna just use mine and your name okay so so joe storm is going to wrestle terrific tony this coming weekend okay so now tony is posting on on joe storm's facebook hey brother this weekend i'm gonna beat you so bad your mama's not gonna be able to recognize you and then you come right. back and go oh yeah well i'm gonna beat you so bad your daddy can't recognize you okay for one right. if if i hate you and you hate me why are we friends on facebook right and and that's one of the things that drives me insane is when I see the, these young guys going on social media and they're and they're uh, you know comment on, on each other's page. Um, yeah, okay, get on your page and say this weekend I'm I'm wrestling Joe, Joe Storm and and I promised I'm I'm going to beat him up so bad his mama won't be recognizing him. But now we're not friends on Facebook, so that's okay. But I I think it right. takes away a lot. When and it make to me it makes them look stupid is when they're on social media and they're they're jousting back and forth. Um, me as a fan, I'd be like, okay, wait a minute. If you guys are gonna fight each other, then why are you friends on Facebook? Because I, I don't be friends with anybody I hate. <laughs> you know, it's 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 that's one of the things about social media that I don't like. Uh, as far as how how some wrestlers are trying to promote their match, I think that's definitely the wrong way to do it. Um, I I agree with you. Uh, in principle, um, again, the, uh, a lot of the stuff is very foreign to me, especially some of the things that have happened and been said in the, the last couple of weeks um, mm -hmm. regarding some incidents that have, that have happened at shows. And um, but uh, I don't think that the uh, a lot of I can't say all of, but a lot of the new generation is interesting in. Um, that facade you mm -hmm. know um yeah. today you'll see pictures of of um pop-up of like uh dusty with flair right mm -hmm. uh in social settings that in in that time period you would have never seen oh, no, not um, at all. i'm not sure that there are any sociable there are entering pictures of, of like us with tommy and wendell but i'm not sure there exists sociable pictures and if they do it's just like the flair and dusty stuff it's like family album and stuff that yeah somebody has just now decided to post and and people were uh, again invested in the match emotionally invested in the match to a level they can't and uh, i think a lot of the young guys don't even uh they they don't care about that aspect of the business, and it could be it's just been ex exposed so much that it's harder for that work to work. Um, but it it is possible if you you put in the work. I can make you a uh, one hundred percent a believer, especially when I'm working heel. Mm -hmm. You know, I can make people absolutely want to kill me. You know, I did a show in fourteen in Lorenberg and I had a old man threatening to shoot me in 2014 mm -hmm. for being in character. You know what I'm saying? It's right. hot now. Not, am I saying that's the best kind of heat? Not necessarily. Not when you, you today people are crazy and had yeah. it been a young person, I might've been concerned. I wasn't very concerned that an older person had lost it enough that he was actually going to try to shoot me. But you know, you know, in, in that era, you know, it, it was definitely more dangerous to be the hot heel. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were heels uh, before uh, the NWO pop popularized the, the cool heel, you know. Right. Um, I always felt that uh, during that period, if we were the cool heel, then we weren't doing our jobs correctly. That's not how I came up in this, you know. Right, that's me it, too. It, it wasn't to do flashy moves. It was to do things to be despised to help get the baby over <clears throat> and things like that. So uh, back to your original point. Uh, yeah, I don't think a lot of these guys even, even want a, a facade. But, um, you know, you if you put me in the right setting and you, you put me in front of a crowd, I can 100% get people to think, well, what I saw before this was bullshit, but what he is doing, you know, this this guy's really an ass, or this guy's really trying to hurt someone, mm -hmm. when it's, 
you know, of course, the feathers thing that's actually going on, but um, it, it's possible. But um, you know, especially some of the guys that that have started wrestling in the last five years, I'm not sure. But they may be dependent upon the trainer. I'm not sure that they had that that knowledge or the skill set to be able to to accurately do that to try to engage a fan on that type of emotional level. They can definitely pop them with the 450 splash and the half gainer moonsault mm-hmm. and the, the things, um, things of that nature. But to, to engage them to the, to the emotional level where they despise them to the degree that they're ready to attack them. Um, I, I'm not sure that's in, in the skill set. For a lot of these new cats yeah and you know uh, what one, you know one, what i'm saying right and one of the things that that, that jimmy Vallant taught me at re, and at his wrestling school was um you, you you have to be able to be able to play these mind games with the fans if you're going to be a good heel like if you know you and and, and, he, and he always taught me little, little less sometimes is a whole lot more um than than going out there like like so you got the, you got these these young kids that go out there and do do these ten thousand high spots that the fans are like what what what's going on they don't understand where when I get out there I as a heel I come to the ring and I tell them I'm I'm, I'm going to beat this guy up and I'm going to do this I'm going to do that and then they start booing and I say you know if you people don't shut up if I hear one more boo I'm leaving you don't get no stinking match and now they're really booing and now you know now I'm really got them hating me. And then I get in the ring, and then I, I I go to lock up with the guy, and and he he's he's out doing me, and I'm like, okay, I go in my tights, I get a gimmick out, I don't use it, but I let, I let the fans see it, and they go, oh my god, he's got brass knuckles, or he's got he's got this, he's got that, and for for the next five minutes, I work that, and I got that crowd feeling the same way that those other guys did, and they're and by the time they're twenty or twenty five years old, they're gonna be able to walk. And I'm and me at forty five. I'm still getting around pretty well, <laughs> and it's just because working smarter, you know, a, a, a lot of times, you know. Oh, I, absolutely. And uh, as you say, and uh, when uh, in the in the day, the more recent day, I guess, than the NDW days when I worked the CWF locker room, that's what I tried to impart to some of those guys. I can get the same reaction that you're getting but I don't have to bump 50 times in the match and I don't have to do all of this crazy stuff because the, the, the one thing that is different I think today though, and I'll give my hats off to the guys there are some tremendously um, athletic uh, people in the wrestling business as far as their ability to do gymnastics and flips and that's more common today that it was then because it's a totally different technique. And, um, but, um, with that comes the damage to your body. And there mm-hmm. were some kids that, that worked that locker room down there that, that I tried to explain to them, you can do 50% of the stuff that you're doing right now and get the same reaction. So why would you, damage your body and these are young guys under 30 years of age on their third and fourth knee surgery and things like that when uh and and don't get me wrong i'm sure that in their mind uh one that their way was the right way and mine wasn't and i'm not saying that mine was uh intrinsically better but it would it's definitely better for their body Mm -hmm. but I may not be the bastion of knowledge there because I took 8,000 unprotected chair shots to the head um, where these guys, you know, will will bail out and block and and things like that. So, uh, you know, I I have knowledge of some of this because I've made the mistakes, uh, never the mistake of, of, you know, doing a a 450 to the floor and, and damaging my knee because... I don't think I'm physically gifted enough to even try that. I'd probably break my neck. Yeah, you. Know, but, um, I wouldn't do it either. But um, uh, and, and it also with with the constant high spots, it desensitizes the fans. Um, now on you know in in our day, 
you built the the card. You know, the, the beginning match wasn't doing stuff that the main event was not going to be doing. You know, you everybody knew their slot on the card. They they knew how to build the momentum to the main. Now you've got move guys moonsaulting in the first match mm-hmm. um and when the fans have seen that constantly then i mean there's no more shock value to what you can do yeah. by the end of that show it's just a spot fest there's no psychology to what they're doing to build up to the thing and they kick out of everything now mm-hmm. you know when you when you and i first got into this you didn't kick out of a pile driver. You didn't kick out of a DDT. You didn't kick out of a power bomb. These guys are super kicking each other 16 times in a match and popping up like it's nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not selling anything. And, and again, in my opinion, that desensitizes the fans to the importance of the finisher. You right. Know? And like, like nowadays, especially on the independent circuit, um, you, you you don't you don't see a lot of matches like that. A lot of them are, you know, they're clean pins and all that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, you know, how 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 are you going to make these people want to come back and see you next month if if you if you already gave them everything in this first in the first match out? You know what I mean? Absolutely, it's crazy. Well, uh, you you've touched base on Thomasville. Um, so uh, at at one point. You you're running your own promotion there in Thomasville, correct? Um, well, yes, Tom, Thomasville. Uh, in the the second run of um, East, my my promotion was East Coast Pro Wrestling, and um, there were two different incarnations of the promotion. Um, the the first incarnation of the promotion we ran High Point Burlington. Um, we didn't go anywhere near Thomasville during that time. There were people still actively running it, so I stayed away. Um, we did uh, Whiteville, um, Roseboro. So we, we did a split. Uh, my, my first business partner was um, a guy I wrestled with at the Carolina uh, Wrestling Alliance down there. His uh, name's Jeff Barber, and he wrestled briefly as J.B. Diamond. And, um, I had, uh, by that point, uh, I'd done a lot of traveling, we were kind of slowing down. There was a, a time period that, uh, Damien and I had, um, split, um, prior to me starting that promotion. We were working with, uh, with various places and, um, he had come to a point where he just did not want to do all the traveling as much anymore. Um, so he was doing primarily stuff, um, still with Spence, Mm -hmm. uh, up here. We both were, but, um, I was still going out and, and doing the circuit and traveling and, you know, maybe tagging with someone else or just doing things on, on my own. And, uh, at that time, um, I don't know if Ken sold, or he just had some people come in that he was advising and that was, uh, a man and a woman named uh, Pam and Randy Harding. Okay. And CWA became uh, World Wrestling Promotions, WWP. So these guys come in. Um, uh, again, Damien didn't want to travel as much, so we were primarily working with them. And eventually I started um, helping book that promotion. And, uh, I, you know, Ken either left or it, it phased himself out. Um, I, I don't know what the kind of the arrangement with that was, but I started helping these folks book. And then, um, you know, Damien come back and he was like, you know, I'm tired of working for these people, you know? So I, he, I, I don't know what exactly was going on there, but he, he decided he didn't want to work just there or he didn't want to work there anymore. He, he had gotten bored of just working with them. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, in one of my biggest blunders, um, I was like, well, you know, I'm I'm making decent money. 
helping book this stuff. So I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, just give up the cash or whatever. So, um, we split and then, uh, he tagged with, uh, Justin Fiji son. And, uh, so I was doing the WWP thing and I think he went back to USIWF and, um, I booked for them for a while and then things, the, the money arrangement that we originally had started to dwindle. And then there was problems with, with, um, get the money that I was supposed to get for the comps and for, because I was booking in wrestling, but, um, the, the money thing just, it didn't pan out. Right. And, uh, I gave my notice and, um, told him I was out. Actually, Ken was still involved during that time period. So okay. I honestly, I don't remember how I got into booking, but he was still there. But so I'm helping him do some of the booking stuff or, or whatever. And, um, and then, uh, you know, I'm old school when it comes to the money. If you tell me you're going to pay me, no matter what it is, if you tell me you're going to pay me $10, tell me you're going to pay, pay me a thousand dollars. I expect to get whatever the money is. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, it just got to the point where I wasn't happy. The money wasn't there the way it was supposed to be. And, uh, and I left and that was the, uh, I, I call up, um, we had run some shows down East and with, uh, Jeff was helping us as like a uh, area type agent when they decided they wanted to go down there. And we had done some shows down east of the White Bull area, and um, we did a um, a big show at uh, the Myrtle Beach Pelicans Ball Stadium on July 4th. Um, that was more of a ring rental because that was Bobby Fulton's show. Okay. <laughs> About three weeks later, we had um, run a, a show up here, and I, I told them that that was that I was essentially given my notice that, that I was leaving. And, um, so I do a final show with them and that was at, um, a love or maybe not love, but it was definitely a mobile home park in Winston Salem. Okay. And, um, it, it was the weirdest vibe that day. Um, I worked, uh, Michael Bahio, who owns High Spots, uh, was wrestling as Ethan Cage, and uh, I was working him on the show. And I go into the the locker room, which was a trailer, you know, a new trailer that we were all in. Mm-hmm. And I'm not exactly sure what they told the boys about about me leaving, um, but I walk into that dressing room and people that I came up in the business with would not speak to me. They wouldn't speak to me. Most of them wouldn't even look at me. So it was a real weird vibe. And, um, uh, I think during the course or short of Michael, um, uh, only one other person in that locker room even spoke to me that day. So I change, we go, we do our match and then I'm out, I'm gone. You know, mm-hmm. um, I try to, uh, reconnect with Damien. Um, something was going on there that I still don't quite understand, but, um, so I reach out. I don't hear anything. Uh, essentially I called him and I was like, I'm done with them. So if, if you want to hook back up, let's hit the road, you know? And, um, uh, did get a response from him. Uh, I, I call it Jeff and I'm, I'm like, look, you know, I got this, uh, concept. I want to do some shows. I need to partner. Are you interested? He says, yes, we, uh, go up to Ohio and, uh, we bought a ring, we had belts made, um, to set this thing up. I start running and we did, we would do essentially two shows up here and then two shows down East. Uh, we run a few shows, uh, up here, we're running a shoot through shows down East and 
and things like that. And then um, probably about six months in, I get a call from Damien. And um, during that time period, ironically enough, he had went back and started working some WWP shows. And um, he's like, look, I've had enough of this shit. Let's, uh, let's get together and talk. We get together, we talk. He comes in, we reform the tag team, then we split to work each other. Um, and I'm one of the few people that I know of that's promoted shows and lost way more matches on my shows than I ever won. I just want to throw that in there. You and me both. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, he comes in, we tag for a little bit, we split, we start to feud. Um, houses are okay. You know, we're, we're, we're not NDW. We never had that period where we made a ton of money. You know, we covered, we made a little money. We tried to have nice stuff. You know, we, we had one of the first rings around here. You know, we spent a lot of, like 10 grand on that ring. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and it was a, a model. Uh, they, they took the design elements from it to, to help design what they sell now at high spots. It was a monstrosity, different, totally different ring. It, it was small sections. It was a spring ring, you know, things that they definitely improved on with mm-hmm. the rings of today. But um, uh, did some things. Things worked okay for, for a while. Um, we, uh, in, I think it was 2001 is when we did the, Damien and I did the, uh, fans bring the weapons match against each other. Um, he, he found out at that point he had diabetes and he was really looking on it as that being a, a end of life type thing for himself. And, um, he was just convinced that, you know, he, he was shot and it, it was a hereditary thing. His dad, uh, I believe, Someone in his family, the mom or dad, had diabetes that affected him very bad physically. So um, he says, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this physically, so he's going to leave. We did the build-up to fans bring the weapons that people, certain people anywhere, still real gaga over today. Uh, Ironically, we did three different weapons matches, two of fans bring the weapons and then the one in... uh, Pikeville, Kentucky for that TV tape and which was just a weapons match. Mm-hmm. I thought it was the worst of the three. <laughs> um, but we definitely left it all in the ring that night. Very emotional. He left. Um, we continued to run. Um, and, uh, and if I could, and I know this thing has probably gone on way longer than you expected when we started, uh, I, there's one thing that happened during that promotional run that I want to touch on. Okay. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with the the weapons match. Um, th- uh, there was a point um, prior to the weapons match that um, we were trying to spark interest. So, um, you know, uh, Tommy, who was one of our greatest opponents during that time period, he had uh, jacked up his back. He had back surgery. He couldn't wrestle anymore, but we brought him on a, on a creative level. And we did a show that, um, and this was prior to the weapons match, that um, was monumentally disastrous um, in the eyes of the fans. Um, and that's not to say anything, of course, uh, bad about Tommy. Mm-hmm. He just, he came in and he tried to change too much too fast. We brought him in, in in creative, and he was also an investor. And, um, you know, during the point when we started running was when everybody first got the uh, – it, it started to be a thing where um, the money was guaranteed, right? Right. Back, back before uh, guarantees became a thing, it was a truly a handshake agreement. I'll take care of you. It was generally based on how the promotion drew Excuse me, and things of that nature. Well, we we'd invest a lot of money in the promotion, and we were trying to pay the guys well, right? We were doing payouts during that time. 
that some guys aren't making today. You know, of course the names are, but you know, like the, the indie level guys. Right. And, um, so, um, we, we hemorrhaged some money. He came in as an investor and he did the show and it was nothing but hot shots, right? A mm -hmm. bunch of weird angles and things like that. And one of the things that they did or, or that he did as part of the book was, um, we had uh, like a, a Royal Rumble type thing or a Battle Royal type thing where they were going to crown a, a new heavyweight champion. And the bad story to that was um, Red Jones, who's you know you know Red. Everybody oh knows yeah, Red. he's a referee now. But the, when he first started, he was a wrestler just like one of us, and um, we called him the 1.5 Kid, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and you can, you know, people that know about that type of thing know what I'm talking about. And the funny thing is, I, I don't know if he ever smoked weed, but we thought it was funny. And um, so he was like our, our little uh, Spike Dudley guy, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we started building him up. And he was doing the acid drop like Spike and the whole bit, you know. And we built up this thing, and he was supposed to win the heavyweight title. Um. Uh, I, again, no knock on him uh, or Tommy. It, it was the booking decision that was made, okay? And um, his his son was actually born the night of that show. His wife had went into labor. He was at the hospital. He couldn't be there. So uh, we inserted Willie G, Will Gatlin, okay? okay. Yeah. In, in that role, right? And because the show was nothing but hot shot at angles, we were running it up until that point. We were running a very traditional, uh, you know, old school type of event. Builds up, long storylines, things like that. Will, uh, there, there's this weird scramble at the end that I wasn't a part of, but, um, and, and it involved Tommy as the commissioner jumping in and pinning somebody. Uh, Damien was a part of that. And the, and this could be, again, I've been hitting the head a lot. It could be post-weapons match. But the end result was Willie ends up with the heavyweight belt, right? Mm -hmm. The fans shed on it. Um, you know, there, there was a segment that liked it, the tra traditionalists hated it. But the worst thing that happened there was a couple of the guys, um, and that, and by this point, the internet's becoming more prevalent, right? Mm -hmm. Go on the, they go on the internet, and um, they, you know, um, specifically uh, Randolph and Brad, and say, you know, I mean, it was their feelings on the matter that he wasn't prepared for the spot, which he probably wasn't. But he didn't deserve the title and, and all of this stuff in a, a public setting, you know? Mm -hmm. And that really bothered Will. Um, he never said anything to them directly about it. I feel confident, but he did talk to me about it. And and I want to say this to, to anybody that saw those shows or, you know, and, and thought that that was the worst booking idea in the world or whatever. Um, Will was not long in the business at that time, and I call everybody kid because of my age. But that kid only did what he was asked to do by the by the booker and by the promotion. Now, quickly, the belt was taken off of him, and um, it was supposed to go to um, Rob McBride, but he couldn't meet some obligations. I'm about a Kiss concert, and and in the end. And something that I never should have done, I ended up with the heavyweight belt, but it was more of a necessity thing because I knew I would be there at every show. And we start having rashes and those shows, not anything to do with money, just people by that point had decided that personal things were more important than wrestling things. And mm -hmm. I never viewed it like that. And then in the second incarnation of ECPW, um, you know, I got the wrestling business, and while I was um, 
I, by that point, I'd left EMS and I was working in law enforcement. And bulk of my law enforcement career, career I didn't wrestle. And um, I actually had to, to get permission when I decided that I wanted to start wrestling again. And, and there were some hinky stipulations to it, like uh, I worked for Randolph County Sheriff's Department. And in order for me, if I did anything down there, I had to be under a hood. And, of course, couldn't do anything that could possibly jeopardize the, the image of, of the agency, which I totally understand. Mm-hmm. But I am the hill that I am, so that limited you know, things I could do down there. And, um, and all of that, then we got a, a group, uh, Jeff and I, um, so the original incarnation, we ended up folding the promotion was the, the, the short version of it. There was some drama with, um, that involved Scott Hartman and, and some other stuff. And I finally decided to hell with it. I'm, you know, it's not worth a aggravation. I did the law enforcement gimmick. Get back into wrestling. Jeff and I get together. Uh, Tommy and um, and one of my kids, and we decide we're gonna to give this another shot. We're gonna run some shows, and everything was centered around Thomasville, and because it, uh, that place always has a special place in my heart. Oh yeah, mine know? too. Uh, it's where I started, and ultimately it. It's probably where I'd love to wrestle my last match if anybody decides they're ever going to run it. We did some shows. We brought in the Terminators, who were some of our biggest rivals in WWP and CWA, Ken's version of CWA. And we, I think we worked with them a couple of times on the NDW shows with, with Plano, too, in the very beginning. We had a long history together. Thomasville loves the Terminators. Oh right, my gosh, and yes. Thomasville historically hates the storm. So, quick heat, easy money, something we can we can do to draw. And um, ironically enough, that that match and that uh, angle was never supposed to happen. We get together, we we book five shows five months out. We do tournaments to crown champions, and then. In, in uh, my biggest introduction to the business in the way it used to be, nothing that we had originally planned worked out. We brought in Big Day Sebastian Kane to be with us. And what was supposed to have happened, there was going to be a tag tournament. There was some guys from CWF called the Killbillies that I really liked their gimmick, and they were good guys. But one of the guys decides at the, the night of the finals of the tournament that his girlfriend wanted to go to the beach, so he wanted to do that more than he wanted to wrestle and make money. And again, no ill will towards him. It's just the generation. Everything gets turned upside down, but the original angle for us was we were going to retire anyway. And um, we're going to work a program against them Simultaneously, Big Day Sebastian Kane is going to work a program with Mecca Mercenary. Sebastian's with us um, as kind of a tweener. Mecca is a baby. Um, the accumulation was going to be a cage match in which we um, uh, dropped the tag belts to the Killbillies, and um, Sebastian and Mecca were going to work earlier in the night. Becca was going to come in, menace us, uh, destroy us. Sebastian was going to come out like he was going to help us. They were going to turn on us, handcuff us to the ropes, beat the shit out of us with chairs. We were going to just retire after that and set up a, a program with the Killbillies and Becca and Sebastian as the huge heel team. And um, all of that went down the hill, so we picked up the phone and called our buddies the Terminators. We brought them in. We um, originally was going to bring them in for a um, just like a one or two shot deal. Um, we uh, they come in, they liked what we were doing. Um, the the original concept for bringing them in, Tony, was they were just going to come in. They were going to beat us in a couple of matches. We were going to you know pop the crowd, mm-hmm. try to get some interest in the promotion type deal. Match two, they decide that um, 
that we're going to take this a little further. And um, one thing that I would have never done as a booking decision was I never put us over the Terminators. Right. right? Mm -hmm. That was their call. So second match, we get color on them, and uh, we should have known that we were going to have problems then because the, the crowd, which is mostly family and friends, mm -hmm. go ape crap stupid. Um, we about have to fight the crowd that night which led us to the cage and um, the, uh, the insulin right <laughs> at that point, which we had encountered many times in our career, but never thought would happen, you know, in the modern era. Right, yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, several of those shows, I, I did work. I did work for you on those shows. and But I remember that show uh, where the little riot broke out, uh, or near riot, um, I I'm trying it was, to. It was a baby riot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember why, I, but I had I had to leave right after my match. I don't remember now what it was, but I, I had something going on with my personal life. So I can't really remember, but I remember working my match, staying to like intermission, and then uh, leaving. And then you called me like the next day and said, uh, "Brother, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to tell you bye." Um, I, I know you had some issues. You had to leave, but I could have really used your help. And I'm like, why? What do you mean? <laughs> and you're like, well, uh, the whole locker room had to empty out to to get order restored. I'm like, what? It's like, oh. And then you told me about you know how the the fans try to get in the ring and to climb the cage and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, what? But I knew right away because like for all them years of working with Ken and of course, you know, the Terminators were like a mainstay with Ken. Um, their family was always got rowdy. And, uh, when, when, when they came out. Yeah, they, um, so we, we booked the cage that night. Um, many things happened, um, logistically that, that helped encourage that stuff. Um, the previous shows, we had used uh, Les Parker's ring, which is a 16 by 16 ring. Yeah. He also had security railing. Now, it didn't extend all the way to the dressing room, but it was definitely a barrier at ringside. When we booked the cage, we couldn't find a cage for a 16-foot ring. Uh, there was a guy that had one, but he wouldn't rent it. He just wanted to sell it, and we were not going to buy a cage for a shot. Right. So we we ended up renting CWS ring, which is a eighteen foot ring, and they had done a show, um, the the previous weekend, that um, and um, that that they had high spots cage for right. So we're in the ring in the in the cage mm -hmm. because the ring was bigger. We couldn't use the security um, barricades because there wouldn't have been enough room to walk around the ring. Okay. So we we lost the protection of the security barriers. And we had an idea, because of the way the crowd had reacted the previous two shows, that there was probably going to be some problems. So we brought in extra security. And um, so the the... The deal was supposed to have been we do the cage match, they beat us clean in the cage, which in theory would have been enough to quell the uh, the crowd, we thought, anyway. But mm -hmm. we were going to do a thing that if it got rowdy, we were going to get them back into the ring and put them over on the mic, and that way we could kill people out. <clears throat> on the way to the ring, when we're coming through the curtain, we, but like the, the refs had got with security, and there was like this wedge. If, if things got out of control, a way to get us out of the ring to get us back to the dressing room. And um, there, there was pre plan that failed miserably, but um, and it was destined to fail anyway because we were using some of CWS guys uh, as security. So none of the security guys were the same height, so the wedge wouldn't work. They would have just punched over top of some of those guys, but mm -hmm. I digress. Anyway, we're coming out. They get the entrance music. 
we start out. There's a group of guys that are standing to the right of the uh, entranceway along that back wall. Mm -hmm. As we start out, one of the guys does um, this like you want to go type mouth gesture to me, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I stopped and being me in full me mode, I go, what you want to do? And the guy steps. He's not very far from me uh, because the, the entrance was angled. And he comes up to me, and he does this, like, little high school shoulder bump thing, right? And I pushed him back. Well, what I did not realize was, one, when I pushed him, I pushed him evidently a whole lot harder than I intended to, and he hit the wall. But as soon as I push him, I turn around and I'm still going to the ring. Mm -hmm. He and his buddy start towards me. Security gets in between us. Again, that, I don't know any of this stuff at the at the time that it's going on because I've got my back to them. Right. And some words are exchanged between these guys and a couple of the security guys. Also didn't know that uh, one of those guys dated one of the daughters of one of the Terminators, right? <laughs> so oh, gosh. Okay. We, we get into the ring, and we do the match. You know, normal cage match. We bleed all over the place. Um, Johnny B's got color, the Terminator that doesn't wear the mask. Mm -hmm. And all of this, they hit their finisher. They beat us. They get out of the ring. They go over and cut a promo about retiring, like just a spot promo that they decided to do. You uh -huh. know, you'll never see us in the ring again and all this. We get ready to leave the cage, and the crowd is already pushed against the cage. And uh, one of the wives is just letting me have it, straight cussing me out. We don't do that to, to family and Yada, 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 all this. Now, keep in mind that uh, I love the Terminators. I love their family, but their family is notorious for swinging on people and spitting and, and acting all kinds of goofy anyway. But, um, and I'm literally telling her, I'm, I'm talking to her, you know, but kind of yelling. I'm like, what are you talking about? We, I thought she meant that she felt like we took liberties with them. You know what I'm saying? Right. And people are, are, are pushing and, and this and that. And um, I look to, so she's up on the cage near the door, doorway of the cage, which is facing the, the dressing room area. And I look over and I, I see a female absolutely just, she jawed. Security people. I mean, she right hooked him. She punched the crap out of him oh in the face, gosh. you know? And I, like, I'm kind of stunned. And then all hell breaks loose. She goes to punch him again. He grabs her arm. And then from the left side, from, like, stage left, this girl comes running full speed, and she tries to do a diving Superman punch on the chick that hit the security guard, which is one of the, the like, the, the girl that hit the uh, security guy is one of the kids mm -hmm. of, of the Terminators, right? That's his girlfriend who sees him get punched, and she does, literally does a beautiful, she missed her, but she does a diving Superman punch at this chick, and all hell breaks loose, and oh. then the crowd starts fighting, right? Uh -huh. Well, the girl that punched the security guy picked up a chair, and when she picked up the chair, somehow I end up on the floor, okay? Oh, no. Um, I grabbed the chair from her, and I, I probably, contrary to what my brother will tell you, I was not going to hit that girl with the chair. I was just trying to get the chair away from her so she couldn't hit him. Because when she picked it up, she held it like we would hold the chair if we're getting ready to blast somebody, right? Oh, my gosh. I grabbed the chair, and I threw the chair. I get grabbed from behind. I slammed that person back up against the cage because I got grabbed, you know, and I'm trying to mm -hmm. get them off of. 
it was actually my brother. He, you know, he was managing us because he wasn't wrestling. Oh, okay. And so, so Damien has grabbed me because he can see the crowd moving on me and I can't. I'm focused on trying to prevent her from waffling him. Uh huh. I slam him up against the cage and he's going, you're killing me. Stop pushing. And, uh, and, and I was like, get off of me. And he was like, get in the cage, get in the cage. So I look, and then you know the crowd's starting to press towards us, and the crowd's actively fighting one another. It's the weirdest stuff, Tony. You <laughs> couldn't make this stuff up. Oh my gosh! So hey, I missed that. I get in the cage. They get, grab the security guy that that has gotten jaw. They get him in the cage. So it's uh, it's uh, Lee, Damien, myself, uh, Red is the referee. And the security guy are, are in the cage, right? Mm-hmm. And that's when people are, um, you know, slamming up against the cage. They're actively fighting each other, acting like they're going to try to climb the cage, which, you know, we're in the probably the most safest place we can be during this melee. But I'm also thinking in my mind as a promoter, I'm going to lose my deposit on the building. They're going <laughs> to tear this place up. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't believe the fans are actually fighting because this is to me this is silly, especially in the modern era. Right. I got I got Ken Spence there. He came in to MC the the uh, Hall of Honor ceremony. Uh, I got Bobby Fulton who has his kids there, and um, and I, I'll touch on Bobby in a minute. But uh, so anyway, I hear from behind me, "Watch your back. He's got a knife." And, and there is a guy, and he's pacing on one side of the cage with his hand in his pocket. And and he told me flat out that he was going to stab me, right? Well, oh, no. Then, then I lose my cool, and I'm starting to climb over the cage to get to him because I'd already told him I was going to take the knife away from him and cut it. So they're trying to pull me down, and... um. I get down, and what what truly brought me out, because at this point now I'm in a rage because I'm pissed off that they're, you know, Mm -hmm. they're tearing the place up, and and now I've really lost my cool. And the thing that brought me down was I looked over towards the dressing room wall, and Johnny B is out there, uh, one of the Terminators, you know, Terminator number two. Oh, yeah. And, And he is choking a guy, and he has got him double clutched, by the throat on his tippy toes, right? Mm -hmm. And so it immediately like brought a a confusion, but a calm to me because I'm trying to figure out why is my baby face choking a fan, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, by this time, they've all the guys, the locker rooms empty, the the armory guys out there, and they're literally grabbing people and tossing. Uh, my oldest daughter got kicked in the face during all this. Had, oh, had I seen no. that, I, I really would have hurt somebody. Yeah, for sure. Jail. But so they're 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 dragging people out like bouncers, you know. And um, I'm looking at still looking at Johnny, and he's pointing, get him, and where he's mouthing, get him, and making a head motion as he's choking this guy. And I turn around, and the security guy is got his shirt off and he's standing on the second rope behind us and there was uh in the ensuing investigation that i did to try to figure out what the breakdown of this crap was those two um had had words um because he was trying to get up to the cage that was actually johnny b's son that's my understanding that he was choking and trying to get to calm down oh and evidently, he was throwing gang signs at the security guy, and the security guy was being a total tart and throwing gang signs back. And <laughs> and uh, now, again, I didn't see them throwing gang signs. It's just something I was told. So mm-hmm. don't, don't nobody get mad at Joe for just repeating. So anyway, they get stuff calmed down so I can get the back. I go in the back. I get chewed out by one of the referees about how this is all my fault. The police are coming to arrest me for assaulting the, the guy that shoulder bumped me. And I'm like, I, you know, and I'm fired up. So I get pissed back at him. And 
We're kind of going back and forth. But anyway, it was a great big shit sandwich. At the end of the day, we got everybody out. The armored guy was actually happy. I apolo- I go to him and I apologize because, again, I'm thinking I've, I've lost the building, I've lost my security deposit. Because they told us when we first started running shows, the police ever have to be called. That's it. Y'all are out. You know? Right. Go talk to him. He's laughing, having a good time, drinking a beer. You know? Said he had a ball. Um, uh, there's women's clothing, including bras, out in the parking lot, where the brawl evidently continued in the parking lot until uh, the police came and cleared it out. I call everybody the day after. I call Spence, and I, I call some of the people that, like, really wasn't involved in the match, but they were out there to see, to try to figure out exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. And um, still to this day don't have a real good grasp other than uh, I, evidently the, the, the dude that did the shoulder bump thing was a boyfriend of somebody in the family and that pissed the family off and that started that stuff. And it was a crap. And at the end of the day, I, the, I was most concerned after I found out everybody was okay. The Terminators were cool and they apologized for their family acting silly. And I apologize about, you know, if the security guy was doing what they said he was doing and, all the boys are fine. Everybody got their money. I was most concerned about Bobby Fulton because he had his kids with him, right. you know? Yeah. And, you know, Bobby, during the day with the Fantastics and the Sheep Herders, they were pretty wild. But Bobby was, um, Bobby means a, a tremendous amount to me in my career. He, he and Jackie gave us real good advice. We worked them on a couple of shows. And they kind of acted as mentors once when uh, I was still move but after we had done those matches I dislocated my shoulder and uh, I'd stop by a show and Bobby had me come out to, to manage him because I really couldn't do anything I was in a sling mm-hmm. and about killed a fan because they grabbed me I guess they, they didn't realize that I was really hurt and they jumped up grabbed my shoulder and he was going to fire him up for it so I'm concerned and we have Wrestlecade that was um, I think the first Wrestlecade because I did the first couple it may have been the second it was two days later on that Saturday. Uh-huh. So I go in and, um, I'm, you know, I, I go over, I find Bobby and I, I'm apologize. I was like, Bobby, I'm so sorry. I look like death warmed over, you know, my head is all ragged out from the cage scrape and all that. Bobby, I'm so sorry that, you know, your kids were there for that. And, and he was great. They smiled. He said, brother, I loved it. They've never seen white heat like that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. Bobby's Bob, Bobby's not mad at me. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah. So Thomasville writes people are. You can still get people to believe. You probably don't want them to believe to that level, or piss them off to that level. But it is still possible to get people invested. Yeah, I mean it's a uh, it's an art. You know, it's an art being able to piss people off like that and get them ready to 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 want to hurt you. You know, I've, I I remember, again, in Thomasville, I was working for Kurt Solo for NEW, and I turned on Jimmy Valiant, and uh, some guy in the crowd's like, uh, I heard him whisper, goes, I'm going to cut that kid when he gets out of the ring. And I looked over, and sure enough, he had a box cutter in his hand, and Randolph, I think it was Randolph, uh, said, hey, Tony, go the other way. I think that fool over there's got a knife. He's going to cut you. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. And yeah. uh I was like, man, and then and then it took me back. I was like, yeah, you know, pick the crowd, Thompson. They 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 take their wrestling seriously. But since since you brought up uh, NEW, I forgot to mention them, and I'm not going to go into detail. We've been on a long time. You're probably going to have to edit half of this out anyway. Oh no, I'm, I'm going to post it or all. break it into multiple shows. But uh, I always enjoy working in NEW. It was good times. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Uh, Kurt Kurt. Uh, Solo is also someone who has a tremendous mind for the wrestling business. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked um, well, I worked several people on his shows, but it was like I think the second or third match I ever had with Corey Edsel. Um, I worked Corey in his first match when I was ACW Hardcore Champion when he was like 16 years old, and I didn't know it. Mm-hmm. And um, uh. A little story on that. We're in the back, and he's never bled. He wants to bleed in the match, and he wants me to gig him. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, brother, I'm not doing it. But, you know, so I show him how to make the gimmick and all of that. And in the end, he's too nervous to to, um, to do it himself. And I absolutely wasn't going to do it. I've never done it to anybody, nor do I ever plan. And like I say, Link's the only person I've ever allowed to do it to me. Mm-hmm. And um, so he decides that he's going to juice hard way. And I've got this cheese grater. And uh, the cool thing about a, a, a cheese grater, if you've never bled off of one, there there's a side that has like little, it's almost like a cutoff spike on it. It's not the grater part, but right. it's like one of the sides is a four-side cheese grater. You don't have to pop yourself or anybody else real hard in the forehead and before it punctures. You, you get good color off of it. Mm-hmm. So... His idea is that I'm I'm going to juice him on this cheese grater. Well, I pull his head back during the match, and I, I go to pop him, and I, I told him don't move. And he moves his head a little bit, flinches as I'm coming down. So I caught him not only on the forehead, but on the top of his nose. Oh, no. He's bleeding like crazy. His mother is in the front row, losing her mind, <laughs> because I've just done this to her son. And we get in the back, and, and – uh, Blaze, that's when he told me that, you know, he's only 16, right? And I'm like, Jesus, dude, I'm going to prison. Mm-hmm. But um, but uh, I worked uh, Corey the second time there, and then we worked a, a singles match on a CWF show when he's CWF heavyweight champion. That uh, Kurt was at that show, and he laid out that match. And it was probably one of the best singles matches of my career. Kurt has an amazing mind for the business. Yeah. Now, do do you know who trained Kurt Solo? I have no idea. Me. Really? Yep. Sure did. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Kurt has uh, an amazing creative mind. He oh. reminds me a ton of uh, uh, creativity wise of uh, Chris Cannon. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, uh, one of the things about Kurt, you know, Kurt and I went to school together. So, I, I, so I've known him since we were like in middle school. And then uh, one day, um, I had uh, started running my own shows, and I had run a show at that bar I was talking about earlier. And he came by, and he's like, "Oh, Tony, I, I didn't know this was your it was your show because I just been wanting to get into wrestling, and I and I knew this show was here in Tom or here in High Point. I'm going to come by and check it out." And I was like, "Whoa!" He goes, "He goes, yeah." He goes, "I I really want to like get in on the promotion side." And, I, and at the time, I was kind of burnt out, so I was like, "Oh." I said, well, yeah, you can be my partner. He goes, well, I want to learn how to wrestle, too. I was like, okay, cool. No lie. Um, I, I, I took him down to my training to my training center um, that I had there, and we worked out for, for five days, and he had his first match <laughs> within five days. Um, and, uh, of course, it was a boogie match that, that we had together, but it, but it, but it, was still, it was still good, you know. So yeah. yeah, so yeah, I had five days. I trained him for five days at my training center, and then he had his first match. Uh, of course, like I said, it was a boogie match, but uh, but any event like the guys had, you know, that I took him to on that show, they had no idea that that was his first match, and he'd only been in the ring like five times <laughs> prior to that. But uh, but yeah, uh, but but like like you said, Kurt caught on to the business so good, and Kurt is one of those kind of guys that makes me mad. No matter what he does. He's good at it, and you know he made gear for so long, and and uh, yep. he's super super great gear maker. Um, I mean, he's he's very artistic, and um, he he can do anything he puts his mind to. It drives me crazy. I wish I was I wish I was half the talent that he was. And you know, I've tried to get him to be on my podcast, and and he says, "Oh, podcasts aren't for me." <laughs> I'm like, "Come on, man, uh, we well, got some great stories." I was like, "We got some great yeah, stories." Yeah, I I guarantee he does. And again. You know, I forgot that he made gear, but mm-hmm. super talented guy. Yeah, it, it yeah. seems like at anything he does. Yeah. Kurt, Kurt's a good guy. I like, him. yeah, yeah. Like I said, I've known Kurt since probably 1986, and uh, and uh, you know, and he's just uh, he's always, he's always been a really good friend. One of the things about me and Kurt is kind of like me and you. We can like go so long without talking, but then once we talk, it's like we never stop talking. You know, never pick, stop. Yeah, pick right back at where we left off at. So, um, so after wrestling, I know you got out wrestling for a while. Um, now, uh, what what are you doing? Um, uh, I'm I'm still uh like 
shoot wise, shoot job wise, I'm a regional manager in rent home purgatory. I know you did that gimmick oh, for a while I there. Sure did, and, yeah. and, uh, and it, it, there's a, a, a special place in Hades for us. Yes, and, there is. Uh, and we love it. But um, I'm a regional manager for uh, Modern Home Furnishings. And uh, um, I have my own uh, shirt business. And uh, I've been uh, printing shirts. We do uh, direct to garment printing, um, some dye sublimation stuff. Uh, we do shirts, promotional products. Things like that that I I wish we would have had access to back in the day for gimmicks. Oh yeah, um, for sure. But uh, I do a, a ton of uh, stuff for wrestling guys. I do CW Anderson shirts. Uh, do the stuff of the Purge, the Ugly Ducklings. I do some stuff for the gymnastic guys. Um, uh, on, on the website, which is a shameless plug here, it's. Um, stormcustomtees.com and also stormtheringtees.com we've got uh, uh, offerings for uh, a lot, well not a, a ton but uh, several of the, the guys on the independent scenes uh, I've got a couple of artists that I work with that, that uh, we do contract printing for like their t-shirts um, uh, probably soon now that uh, we're, we're starting to do some wrestling again we'll drop some some storm legacy designs and and things like that and uh we print just about anything we can do photorealistic work one-off shirts um the, on the promotion win things like uh dog tags and keychains and mugs and and all of that there when the dice printer uh decides it wants to work um i've been uh like i said been doing that for uh about three years i like it if i could uh get the business i would print full time so well i'm i'm sure that uh once once your name gets out there and other people see how great your shirts look um i don't i don't, I don't think uh, there'll be a doubt in my mind that you won't be able to do that uh, I, I hope so we we do some uh outstanding work but it, it's not as it's Really, I, I'd like to say it's all us. A lot of it has to do with the designers some of these guys work with. Um, they they have some uh, very unique stuff. The Ugly Ducklings have a new shirt design at least once a quarter. I think those guys, they, they, they I haven't seen anybody today that gets it, quote unquote gets it in the mm-hmm. wrestling business like these guys. Oh, yeah. They really know how to market themselves. They could do seminars on nothing but marketing, um, but they have a uh, they have designs for every holiday. It's a uh, it's pretty incredible. Like I say, I think they've, they're up to about twenty five shirt designs. Oh, Part wow. of them are on the website. Part of it is I'm so busy between that job and the printing that there's tons of stuff that we need to upload. Um, but we we do um, print drop ship for those guys and. Uh, uh, it was a way for me to stay in the business without being uh, real active in the business. Mm-hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, I like that. We get real busy around WrestleCon, WrestleMania time with the guys going down there. And uh, uh, my wife has a little company. Um, we have Sheepdog, so she has a company called So Sheepy. And we have Sheepdog shirts on there, and we're getting ready to launch a whole line of, uh, like, um, designs related to to the beach and oh, beach nice. therapy and and uh things like that that we've um we've done the test prints on we just need to um, upload to the site and we're going to try to get into more of uh maybe the novelty in but um we we literally can print anything you know if you have a picture of your grandmom that you want to put on the shirt i could duplicate the exact picture uh, something that a screen printer can't do. So, oh, um, that's nice. If anybody's in need of shirts, look at uh, look a brother up. And uh, uh, but I, you know, it, it's it's funny. We we do quotes for a ton of wrestlers. We we print for you know a good amount, mm-hmm. but not every buy that we get. And that's another thing that's real funny about these cats is. They want a super cheap deal, and I'm oh, not yeah. the super cheap printer guy. I'm all about quality. I'll give you a great product. Uh, C.W. Anderson, again, he uses those exclusively now. Um, Scrapyard Dog, we, we're he exclusive with him. We're exclusive for the Ducks. You know, the, the, the people that 
get the shirts. Uh, the boys really, really like the quality of the stuff. John Moses Photography, we do um, all of his T-shirts and and um, and all that good jazz. So uh, that that's my my ultimate goal is to get where we can just do the print business full time. We started with embroidery also. Another cheap plug. Anybody that's interested in embroidery, we don't do a lot. I've got about a $14,000, 15 needle embroidery machine that I will make you a great deal on. Uh, well, that's good to know because I got some. I got some new trunks that I was thinking about getting my initials. At, so there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I can pick you up with that. Um, we, we've talked about doing some dye sub and doing some. Uh, we've done some DTG printing on long bikes for mm-hmm. the ducks uh, when they did. Um, uh, uh, they did a, a bar wrestling and a PWX run that we had the um, that we put uh, the the promotional logos on the the long tights for them, and we're we're gonna do some test runs on um, die sub and um, you know like full length tights and trunks. <clears throat> we just hadn't got to that point where we had time to do it in the R and D phase. Right. Right. Well, very good. Well, I, I wish you all the luck on on your shirt business. I, I know it's going to go really well, and definitely, um, I got I I've definitely will uh you use you to do some embroidery work because I've been wanting to get some done. I've I, I didn't know cool. you I, I didn't know that you done embroidery. I uh I, I asked one of my other friends that I, that has a friend that does embroidery uh, two weeks ago for a quote. I hadn't got the quote back yet, so evidently they they're not very interested in doing it. So. <sighs> I will definitely send it to you. Okay. Well, if, like I say, if you're in need, we don't do a ton of it. Uh-huh. We definitely have the machinery to do it. Okay. Um, it's just uh, we, we can do it, and we can do it competently, and mm-hmm. we can do it well. It's just not my thing, you know? Right. Gotcha. Um, it's different. The The setup is, is tedious to me and uh, and and all of that, and it, it's in, interesting that um the, for the people that do that the especially when you're doing the intricate design the mm-hmm. way that the computer reads that the, the stitching uh, my wife can look at that stuff and she can see the whole design i can't see anything in it to me it's just a bunch of squiggles and mess but um so so really she's the brains behind the embroidery but um so let's talk about some upcoming wrestling dates. Yeah, I was about to ask you that before we close up the podcast. I, I, I know you've uh, got some uh, some dates coming up. We talked about that before we went online, but um, uh, I know the the uh, the Storm Legacy is making their their return to the independent wrestling scene. Yeah, isn't that something? <laughs> should should be interesting. We've got um, so we've. We, we had a, a promoter and now it's been a couple that have reached out to us and um, uh, one of which we've been able to come to terms with and we're still negotiating with but um, we've got some dates upcoming for uh, Carolina Wrestling Zone and that's um, the first is this coming up Saturday which is the Saturday before Memorial Day so come on out and see us uh, May 25th at the Sanford Armory we'll be back with um same promotion on June the 15th in Sanford, but the next time it's at the fairgrounds for CZW Beats Cancer. That's an event for Relay for Life. Then June 22nd, um, CWZ Invade Southern Pines. I believe that's at the armor. And uh, then June 29th, uh, CWZ takes over Siler City. So We've got uh, four dates upcoming with them. We're negotiating um, some July dates with uh, uh, another promotion that uh, is not ready to go prime time yet. We'll see how that works out. And uh, there's still uh, some fight left in these old dogs. And uh, uh, tentatively, we're we're, uh, wrestling the uh, tag team champions, the Amish Outlaws, on the 25th, I guess. As always, the card's subject to change. But, uh, you know, we don't care. We're, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work anybody. We'll wrestle anybody anytime and when. So tell all your friends. That's right. And the cool thing is, is, uh, I'm, I'm on all them shows with you. So you never know. I might have to, I might have to do a run in. And, yeah. I might have to do a run in and help you guys win, you know? 
Hey, I like it. No, you, you, you can't run in and help us win. We're the good guys, Tony. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, See, I'm you so forgot. Used to, yeah. So used to you being the bad guys with me. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I feel confident I'm going to miss being the bad guy. But yeah. uh, ironically enough, everybody that we're talking to promotion-wise um, wants us to come in as babies. Um, so it, it'll, be a, it'll be a fun time to be had by all i'm sure oh yeah it's, um, it's gonna be exciting one, to, to see you guys one, back one day out. one day they may uh smarten up and and realize we'll make them the most money as our uh illustrious former nasty selves but yep uh we can be the good guy now <laughs> so. now um uh, uh on, when with with you guys being back together uh, who 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 all who all is going to be with you okay so um the uh uh, Damien does not actively wrestle, okay. uh, nor does he have any plans to. Um, most people do not know he was in an industrial accident um, several months ago that um, he was very close to losing his life. Oh, no. Um, he got his, uh, he works for a um, concrete company, and uh, evidently, I, I don't know the all encompassing of how concrete is made but uh, essentially they get sand and rock and it goes up this long ass conveyor gimmick and then goes through these big rollers and then it spits it out pulverized on the other side somehow through some mixture of wizardry that becomes concrete at some point but okay. um so he's he's up there you know 35 feet in the air and he's wiping condensation off of uh some instrumentation panel above it and the rollers snatched the rag and before he could release it it took him in all the way almost to his shoulder and um luckily the the people in the control room saw on the camera what was happening they were able to kill the machine and it rolled back enough where it, it didn't take him uh completely to his shoulder, but it essentially took everything from his wrist to his forearm and peeled it upward. And um, he was in Baptist Hospital for a couple of weeks, and uh, like I say, most people, even people inside the wrestling business, don't don't know any of this uh, occurred. Mm -hmm. And um, um, it was hairy for a while. Um, the, the doctor said uh, had the machine run for another uh, two and I think they said two and a half seconds, but less than five seconds that it would have severed his arm and the shoulder. Oh my goodness! And it would have probably been an injury; he couldn't survive. But um, he's bounced back greatly from that. He's back to work, you know. Um, so in in a literally in the span of less than six months, he goes from about having his arm tore off. Now he's back in that truck working overtime like crazy and, wow that's awesome and, ha and and happy to be doing it but um so he doesn't actively wrestle i'm trying to talk his unsociable self into um making at least a couple of these events to come down and and uh uh I, well if it was a singles match be our second so i guess be our third or manage us at the show um they are at his at the, at that place. They're working a tremendous amount of overtime because it's the summer months. He doesn't know if he's going to be able to do it. So it's uh, Lee and I, formerly by a white guy, formerly Lee Edwards, now Lee Storm, um, is a family thing. You know, again, I've been in the ring with this kid since he's fourteen, and now he's a grown man and mm -hmm. you know over thirty and. Uh, um, so, um, we, uh, even well before the accident, Damien knew he didn't want to be in the ring full time. We did a couple of six man things and the original concept was supposed to have been for he and his brother, Evan, to take the Storm Brothers name and they were going to, we're going to give them the name, let them run with it. And it was a way for essentially the storm brothers to live on. Mm -hmm. And then when they, then when they got ready, them finding someone they felt was worthy. And then if they, if they were interested to take the name and move to uh, another generation and, and that way the, the gimmick could live or whatever. And <clears throat> Evan got married and had a kid and 
Um, he really doesn't have a ton of interest in wrestling again. Um, so we uh, came up with the Storm Legacy concept. And even though uh, uh, CWZ is, it has advertised us as the Storm Brothers, uh, which is perfectly fine. I told them that in the future they'll they'll advertise us as Storm Legacy, and um, uh, and it'll be he and I until we decide we're not wrestling anymore. And then I don't know what we'll do with the gimmick. We'll probably just let it die. And uh, um, but yeah, so uh, we're we're a duo until we finish whatever we're gonna do this time and decide either we've had enough or promoters decide eh, we're not paying them the money they want and if they decide that i'm at a different place now you mm-hmm. and i both are you have a family my kids yep. are, are both grown but i have a granddaughter now who's in the cheerleading and volleyball and getting into boys is going to drive me absolutely insane i'm gonna have to cut a promo on one of these little punks oh yeah but um I've been there done and, that already with my daughter <laughs> and uh uh, hopefully one day, if they decide to listen to this, my youngest daughter and her husband will produce me a grandchild too. So uh, I'm at a different place. I, I, we we feel like we can still go. Uh, this will definitely be the test for us. And um, it, you know, if we we start wrestling regularly and we do it for another five years, that's great. If we do these four shows and don't step in the ring again, I'm okay with that too. Um, I'm at, I'm at a good place with this because this is not my wrestling business anymore. So, right. um, and you and I talked about that earlier and I won't get into that tonight because this has gone on so long, but if you ever want me back on, I'll be glad to come on. We'll tell some, yeah, some sure. stories that, yeah. that are PG related and, uh, It'll be great, but I uh, very much appreciate you having me on, Tony. It's been a ball. Man, I've, I've enjoyed it, too, and I'm looking forward to seeing you this Saturday um, at the show there in uh, Sanford. All right, brother. Look forward to it. All Everybody right. come out and see us in Sanford. Sounds good to me. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another edition of the Binge Buster Show. Please tune in next week as we will have a special guest.